In December, I did a list of movies that I found that were ranked up as the worst ever. And afterwards, on my community page, I asked you guys what you thought the worst movie you've ever seen was. And I got a lot of response. Um, so what I did was I looked up all those movies on IMDb and Letterboxd, and I found the ones with the worst scores across both of the sites. Now, some people in the past have requested that since IMDb scores out of 10 and Letterboxd scores out of five, it would be more accurate to double the Letterboxd scores to really see how they compare. Since a movie with a total of five that had a two on IMDb and Letterboxd would be technically the same as one that got a 3.5 on IMDb and a 1.5 on Letterboxd, even though when compared against 10 scores, the second film would clearly be better. So, I gave that a shot. So, let's see how much I'm gonna hate you guys. Number 10. All right, our first entry here, uh, I guess we'll call the top of the bottom. And this one was suggested by Sugar Bombs Destroyer. And it's The Children of the Corn. Uh, the version from 2020 that was just called Children of the Corn, making it the third film with that title. Of course, the original was from 1984 and based on the Stephen King short story. And then there was a remake of that in 2009. This is not a remake and is essentially just another film using elements of that story in a new way, much like all the sequels did. And this is essentially just that, another sequel, but one without a number. It begins with a kid killing a bunch of people and they use gas to stop him and it kills a number of local kids in the process. Little Eden survives and goes off to live with a preacher from a nearby town, uh, a town where Bo Lin lives, and she's ready to leave since she hates it there. The kids are pretty rowdy and hold mock trials led by Eden and they seem to have some pretty awful consequences. So they talk about how the town is broken and all the adults don't care about fixing anything, and they discuss how their crops are all dying. And okay, here's where it gets weird. There's clearly a message in this film. They're trying to draw a metaphor towards the current climate crisis, and there's a major plot point in which the adults are too busy fighting about what caused the corn to dry up, and the children are basically yelling at them to stop their bickering and start working on a solution. The adults decide to vote on what to do with everything, and the kids speak up about not having a say, since what they're discussing is their actual future. So, at this point, you're like, yeah, th these kids have a point, and I'm pretty much fully on their side. But then, the movie has to try to do this whole thing with playing both sides, because then, of course, the kids start listening to He Who Walks Behind the Rose and killing the grown-ups. And I guess you're supposed to still think that they're the bad guys here. The movie really wants you to be against what they're doing at this point. But I'm all like, yeah, I mean, it seems reasonable. I mean, if, if these people aren't taking actions and their inactions lead to these children dying or facing the worst possible future, then they're actively preventing them from seeing that something gets done, then yeah, get them, get them out of the way. But then also, yeah, it, it ends with Corn Groot, and you realize why the original film went so far out of the way to not show the demon. But yeah, this, this has a 3.7 on IMDb, which isn't that bad and a 1.8 on Letterboxd. So if we double that, it's a 3.6, giving this one a total score of 7.3 out of the possible 20, which ultimately isn't all that bad. And, and yeah, the film itself isn't all that terrible. It, it's fine. I think it's whole message of you have to do something, but, but don't put anyone out while you do it is a little misplaced. But I will say this, Kate Moyer, as Eden is great as the villain and evil kids can be tricky because sometimes it seems like they're trying too hard, but she's, she's great. And if there's any reason at all to watch this movie, she's it. <laughs> Number nine. This next one shocked me when I saw it, but it was suggested by Jonesy251 and it's 1987's The Garbage Pail Kids Movie. And I'm actually looking kind of forward to this one. So thanks for suggesting it because I love this trash. Speaking of trash, the movie starts with a space trash can headed towards Earth, but then for some reason it's been in an antiques shop. 
We then meet the kid from the facts of life, and he's being bullied by the least threatening gang of all time. Like, like look at these guys. No, no wonder they have to bully a little kid. Dodger works at the antique store with the captain here, and he's interested in tangerine. And, and here's a fun fact. Katie Barberi here has gone on to become one of the biggest stars of the telenovela world. It was also just in Saw X. They grab Dodger and throw him into the sewers, and I, I, I just can't figure this one out, that there's a bunch of pipes with, I guess, directions on them. Like, it's this way to the city zoo, or to the CIA, or... FBI, which seems like it might be for sewer workers, but then like one of them says toxic waste in, ca in case you need to make Jason Voorhees a kid again. But then there's a pipe just labeled primetime TV, like not a particular TV station, primetime TV. They then cover Dodger in sewage and leave him behind, but he's saved by the garbage pail kids, or at least some of them. There's Greaser Greg, Messy Tessie, Windy Winston, Valerie Vomit, Foul Phil, Nat Nerd, and Alligator. Turns out that the captain is fully aware of them, and he's pretty bummed out that Dodger let them out, and only magic will get them back in. But first, Dodger has to take a bath while they all watch and comment on how cute he is, which is a perfectly appropriate scene for a movie that people were hoping would appeal to children. So, in case you're like, what the hell is going on here? This all began with Cabbage Patch Dolls, those adorable little toys that were a massive phenomena for a while. Then, here's a shock, Art freaking Spiegelman. Yes, that Art Spiegelman, the creator of the Pulitzer, Eisner, and Harvey Award winning Mouse. That guy. He decided that it would be hilarious to parody the dolls with a series of trading cards that would feature a number of gross characters that looked like the Cabbage Patchers. They were immensely popular, and also very controversial, getting banned from schools and also all of Mexico, as well as getting a nice little lawsuit from the Patch Doll trademark holders. Then, Rod Amato, who had been working in film and TV since the 50s and directed a large run of the George Burns and Gracie Allen show and a whole bunch of Dobie Gillis. At this point, he had been mostly doing TV movies and such, but then I guess was like, I, I have to get involved with this garbage pail thing. Not only did he direct it, but he also produced and co-wrote it, although it should be noted that at one point, John Carl Beekler was supposed to handle it, but his version was a horror film where the kids were killers. And what's funny is that one of the things that's criticized pretty frequently in this film is the sort of love story between Dodger and Tangerine, since he's a little kid and she seems to be a grown woman, but in real life. Barbaria is only one year older than Aston, and they were, in fact, dating at the time, although it said that they broke up during the filming of the movie. It had a budget of $1 million and had to take some cost-cutting features, like filming with incomplete animatronics for the kids, and when it was released, it was pretty universally hated. In fact, it's often called one of the worst movies ever made and holds a big ol' 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. It only brought in $1.6 million at the box office and was labeled a bomb and ended up getting nominated for multiple Razzies. And Emito retired from the industry immediately afterwards. And it's currently sitting at a 2.7 on IMDb and a 1.8 on Letterboxd. So if we double that, it gives it the combined score of 6.3, one full point lower than Children of the Corn. Now, you may say to yourself, does this really belong on this list of worst horror movies? And I say yes, for three reasons. One is that Phil Fondacaro plays Greaser Greg, and Phil can be in any list he wants. Two is that the character of Alligator eats human body parts, and at one point has a lunchbox full of human fingers and eyeballs. And three, uh, ha have you seen these masks? They're easily more terrifying than anything else you're gonna see here. Number eight. So far, I feel like you guys have been taking it easy on me since both of those movies were pretty tolerable and I actually enjoyed one. So let's see what Peter Danier suggested. And oh, lovely, it's Jack versus Lanterns, which I coincidentally watched like 
three months ago. But I guess I'll have to do it again now, so thanks! I guess? It begins by letting you know exactly what the quality level is going to be, as a guy is working on a farm, and I guess he has uh, some sort of really fake monobrow, but here's the important part. It's not in focus. At all. Like, this seems like a simple enough shoot that you would see this result and go, oh damn, we need to do that again. But no, not the makers of Jack vs. Lanterns. He bleeds on a pumpkin which brings it to life and it jumps onto his head and transforms him into some sort of creature. And by creature, I mean man with a Halloween mask on. It then attacks some random guy and does the same to him, and then there's this woman whose husband has died, and he was some sort of genetic researcher, and if the characters are talking in a way that makes you feel like you've missed something, then it's because you probably have, since this is a sequel to a movie called Lumber vs. Jack, which I also watched three months ago. In that one, a man named Jack Woods had to fight against a group of genetically modified trees created by the same company that's featured here. And both films were written and directed by Jason LaCourie, who seems to have directed a decent number of backyard ventures like this over the years. He also plays Jack in the movie, and produced, and edited, and did the visual effects for it. It's pretty rough around the edges like that earlier out of focus bit, and characters are constantly out of frame, and some of the audio is hard to hear, and the effects are literally just masks, and the sets look like someone's living room with a curtain put up, and about a dozen other things. It does have a small role for Jennifer Wenger, the Hollywood Boulevard Wonder Woman, and here's the thing, this one has the same IMDB score as Garbage Bale Kids, with a 2.7, and just a little lower score on Letterboxd at a 1.7, and doubled it for a 3.4 for a combined 6.1. But I find something like this really hard to compare. This was clearly made for around 300 bucks in someone's backyard using very limited resources. And sure, it's bad. Sure, the level of filming quality is terrible. But I will say that the main thing that this one has going against it is it is one hour and 46 minutes long. And things don't really start to happen until around the one hour mark, with quite a bit of the earlier proceedings being hit or miss comedy that I personally found mostly miss. But all said and done, it's, it, it's pretty tolerable. I mean, it's definitely the worst of the bunch so far, but on the level that I work on, it's downright enjoyable. Number seven. Going further down, down, down the list, and this next little number comes from 2007, and it's Junk Food Horror Fest, recommended by a man who knows bad movies, Mr. Meat Hook. We kick off with some low-quality home camcorder video of a junky woman killing a guy who gives her a videotape, and then goes off to watch that tape with just some other random guy. And I guess the woman is Calico Cooper, daughter of Alice Cooper? Then there's this guy with a zombie kind of face who says his name is Scarlet Fry, talking directly to the camera, and I guess he's like a crypt keeper sort of guy introducing an anthology. The first tale has a young woman using the laundry room with her neighbor, and she's just moved there, and he invites her to his place, and she's like, sure, strange man I just met, let me follow you alone into your apartment. Of course, he immediately knocks her out and then kills her, chops her up, and then eats her. And that's that's the end. Literally, that's it. If you're expecting some sort of twist or a hook or whatever, it's not going to come. The second story is in black and white and has a nurse who's pretty mean to her patient, and she wheels him around for a while before he's just shot in the head by a random assassin. And oh, oh boy, this is going to be a long one hour and 11 minutes. The next story has skaters meeting up with a version of a gay man dreamed up by a person who has never met a gay person before in their entire life. And I guess they spank him with their boards and he pays them. Everyone then just calls the lead skater guy gay and laughs at him, so he goes and he kills him and then literally just goes home and goes to bed and then kills his girlfriend because she calls him gay again. Um, yeah. 
Again, no point to anything, just classic homophobia. And Scarlet Fry is, I guess, a real guy who is also the co-writer and co-director of this one. And he's made several other films that I guess are very similar in that they're short SOV horror anthology films. And this one has some pretty low scores. On IMDb, it's sitting at a 3.4, which is higher than both Garbage Pail Kids and Jack vs. Lanterns, but its letterbox score is a mere 1.3. So if we double that, we get a 2.6. Then, then this one's total score is a 6. And I think that this is meant to be, I guess, shocking exploitation and edgy cinema, but it's shocking for one thing and one thing only. It's managed to make gore and violence boring. There's nothing to any of these stories. It's just, here's a person, here's another person, one of them kills the other one, the end. Uh, even the gore isn't that extreme since the whole thing looks like it costs around $173. And yep, gotta say, so far this list hasn't been too bad, but things took a turn with this one, and I hope the rest of this roster doesn't follow suit. Number six. This next one I, I can't believe is on here, and it was suggested by Jake the Snake 54, and it's 2023's Cocaine Shark. And it begins with a guy who is kidnapped as part of a drug operation gone wrong and is fed to some sort of mutant shark. And immediately after seeing some of these faces, it's clear that this is a Polonia jammer. It's nice to see Ken Van Sant, considering the last couple Polonia films I covered didn't have him in there, but this has another Polonia regular here with Titus Himmelberger, and he's in a hospital, but also a prisoner doing a noir style voiceover. So there's this drug called HT25 that is extracted from sharks, but it has these terrible side effects and creates mutations and creatures which escape. There are a half human, half shark combo, a bat creature with spider legs, and crab shark, half crab, half shark. Neil is a government agent working undercover, and as you'd expect, the shark hybrid is this homemade hand puppet deal. And just in case you're not familiar, or you haven't seen uh, any of the around 50 times I've covered some of his other films, Mark Polonia is a Pennsylvania-based, low-budget backyard filmmaker who has been in the business since the 80s, where he made movies along with his twin brother, John. John passed away back in 2008, with Mark continuing on making silly mockbuster-style movies and has made four of the unofficial Amityville sequels, including, of course, Amityville in Space. He tends to use the same cast of actors in his films, and, and this is like the sort of stuff that I'm down for. I think he's at his best when he's seriously trying to make a film just with no budget, as opposed to doing something more self-aware and tongue-in-cheek. And Here's the mini scoop on this one. It was originally shot as Narco Shark, since around 90% of this story is the whole drug deal aspect of things and was possibly a riff on Narcos, but was titled Crab Shark when it was released in Japan. However, in between that and its US release, there was a ton of buzz for Cocaine Bear and a bunch of mockbuster style knockoffs quickly rose up. So this was then retitled to Cocaine Shark. Even though there's no cocaine in the movie and the drug involved is HT25 and the shark itself doesn't take the drug. It got pretty poor reviews when it came out and it's only at a 1.9 on IMDb, which I should point out is lower than any of the other films I've listed here above by like a good amount. Its letterbox score actually dropped between the time I conceived this list and got around to watching it since it was at a two, but is now at a 1.9 for a doubled score of 3.8. So its combo score is a 5.7. And I have no idea how this has a lower score than Junk Food Horror Fest since it's, it's fairly amusing. It, it has a plot at least, as meandering as it is. And if you appreciate homemade horror, it's doing some fun stuff. I, I think you have to kind of dig Polonia's whole vibe, which I do, so this may not be for you, but I certainly don't have this too far down on my list of worst movies. Number five. All right. Do you have any idea how long I've been avoiding covering this next movie? Well, thanks to Greg Logie 6855, I no longer can because he suggested 2006's Slaughtered Vomit Dolls. And I guess, here, here we go. It begins in a pretty surreal fashion, showing us some old home video of a young girl singing, but slowed down to a creepy speed. Intercut 
with a woman being attacked and praying in her bed. She's Angela, and she's a runaway, and has turned to prostitution, and I guess is having these hallucinations or visions in which she is seeing women being killed. And of course, that leads to vomit. Real vomit, like a person sticking their hand down their throat to make themselves puke. But, but don't worry, I'm not going to even attempt to show anything of that at all in this video. Just because I had to sit through it doesn't mean I'm going to make you. And, and keep in mind, this is all told with very minimal dialogue, mostly with a distorted voice filter. And I guess I should mention the iceberg. A while ago, I stumbled upon an online image that was the disturbing movie Iceberg. Basically, the further down you went, the worse the movies got. The top layer was like Annabelle, Killer Clowns, and, and they're movies that are pretty easy to get through. Uh, but I do kind of think it's wacky because they have Old Boy on this tier. O old Boy. On, on tier two, they have Seven and Child's Play. So this chart is saying that Child's Play is more disturbing than Old Boy. And like, what? Anyway, I'm sure you've heard of a Serbian film. Well, that's on tier three. This movie's on tier four, so that should let you know what we're dealing with here. But this was made by Lucifer Valentine, and this was his first film, and it was actually the first of what was called the Vomit Gore Trilogy, which consisted of this movie, Regurgitated Sacrifice, and Slow Torture Puke Chamber. But more recently, two additional films were added to the series, bringing it to a total of five. The trilogy all-star Amira LaVey as Angela, and she was an adult film star. And this was her only, I, I guess you'd call it mainstream work, but honestly, like the porn was more mainstream than this. And she died back in 2017 when her and a friend were shot and killed. This one had a 2.3 on IMDb. A 2.3?! This movie's rated higher than Cocaine Shark? I no longer have faith in this world. Its letterbox score is a 1.7 though, so that's a, that's a 3.4 when doubled. So the combo score is a, the exact score of Cocaine Shark. This movie has the same rating as Cocaine Shark. A silly fun movie about a mutant crab shark has the same rating as a movie in which about 31% of it is a woman throwing up into a toilet. Hey. Greg Logie, 6855, I don't know if I said that right. Don't suggest me anything else, okay? Nothing. Number four. Next up, we're headed to 2012 for a film that was recommended by Sha Na Nuff, and it's Apartment 1303 3D. But I'm guessing it's not gonna be in 3D. I don't, I don't have a 3D TV or anything. It's got Marissa Cooper, and her mom is the hand that rocks the cradle, and her little sister is moving out after a dispute where Maddie hit her. She used to be a pop star and has now hit some hard times. And meanwhile, Janet moves into her new apartment and encounters a weird little girl. But even weirder is that she's talking to herself like all the time. I love this picture. What's this? Too. Uh, more on killed my ironing board. News at 11. Ugh, this apartment is freaking me out. Spooky stuff starts to happen when the power goes out and the wind comes in from a window, and then she drops a corkscrew. You know, re really scary stuff. Ugh, this apartment is freaking me out. And the weird girl next door tells her it's a bad place, and then the superintendent is pervy with her, so she has a mental breakdown. And like, like really? This is like 20 minutes into the movie, and so far it's like, first world problems, the movie. I guess I should also point out that Julianne Michelle, the actress playing Janet, is not coming across as convincing here. But then, there's some actual ghost stuff, but this is how it's shot. And yeah, remember how I said that this is first world problems? Well, mom gets herself blackout drunk, and when asked why, she says, Nobody's tweeting me. Oh. And remember when I said that Julianne Michelle wasn't convincing? Well, I, I think that that's not on her. Since we also have Rebecca De Mornay, who I have seen be pretty damn good in movies, deliver this performance. Do you? You're scaring me! 
And usually when you're seeing bad acting from generally good actors, it's likely the fault of the director. And this was both directed and co-written by Michael Taverna. And he's mostly involved in the producing end of things. And this was only the second thing that he directed, with the first thing being a full 15 years earlier. And when I say that he's the co-writer, it's because this was adapted from an existing script by Kei Oshii, because this is a remake of a J-horror film from 2007 that was just called Apartment 1303. And that one wasn't even that well received. And, and I haven't seen that one, but I have to imagine that it's put together better than this? <laughs> And this is dumb, and I mean really, really dumb. Like at one point, Cruiser from Stripes shows up to say, And apartments don't kill people. People kill people. And this does have a 2.5 on IMDb, so thankfully people there did rank this higher than Vomit Dolls. But on Letterboxd, it's sitting at a 1.5. And doubled, that's a 3. So its total is only up to 5.5, so people are claiming that this is worse than that movie, and there's just no way. This one is horribly staged, I'll say that. It's one of the more amateurishly staged and filmed things that I've seen recently that also seems like they had a budget and talent involved, and it looks like it was made on five million bucks. That's what that's what they're saying, I don't know if I believe that. But the script, is, is nothing that terrible. It, it's boring, if anything else, and it feels like a really standard Blumhouse plotline, but directed by someone who took their filmmaking lessons from Tommy Wiseau. It's less awful and more em embarrassing. I, I don't know. I, I can't really say that I really enjoy this one, but I will say that I was incredibly fascinated by it. It's just this weird textbook case of wrong decisions to making filmmaking, and it's like you're watching some sort of before and after, and this is the before stage, and then after you watch this, someone comes in and it's like, well, that's how to do this scene with no tension or atmosphere, so now let's look at the right way to do it. I hate it. Also, can't take my eyes off of it. Number three. We're getting pretty close to the bottom of the barrel now, although we've already hit the floor as far as I'm concerned. But I guess we'll take a look at 2018's Romina now, a Spanish film that was suggested by Arkham Knight Rider 4361. It begins with a number of dead bodies at a camp, including one missing his genitals, and one girl gets away. We then flash back to a group of people, the ones we saw the bodies of, all in a car together, and then there's an extended shot moving back and forth through the car as they have what seems to be an improvised dialogue. And it goes on and on and on and on. At the 15 minute mark, they finally reach the camp and decide to set up and they spot a girl swimming naked in the lake. And, and oh yeah, it's Crystal Lake. Like they call it Crystal Lake. And I'm not sure if they're directly referencing Friday the 13th or, or just sort of rolling with it. They say that it's Romina, a girl from their school, and they go back to partying. And I have to say, horror movies have their share of annoying characters, but these may be some of the more grating examples in recent history. There's not a single likable one in the whole crew. But we just sort of watch them hanging out for a while, and then they see someone spying on them and spend a bunch of time trying to find out who. And there's not a whole lot to talk about because, I mean, not much happens here honestly, um, but around the 40 minute mark, they spot Romina in her tent alone, and she's mostly nude, so they go and attack her, and everything up until this point has been a dull slog and could have taken 10 minutes to convey, so I'm, I'm not sure why we're at this point. But then I guess Romina starts appearing and luring people away, and I guess killing them, but from here on, it's pretty incomprehensible to figure out what's going on, and it doesn't, doesn't make much sense. Especially when a late in the game twist basically makes everything that went before it questionable. But not in a, oh wow, now I need to see it again to see all of this in a renewed light kind of way. But in a, well now that I know that, none of this makes any sense at all and it directly seems to contradict the point of it all way. And then Romina I guess has super strength. Like look, this, this is a regular guy and she hits him in the leg with a stick, which makes him fall, but he's clearly not that hurt. But then it just cuts to him 
tied and gagged. So how on earth was she able to do this while he still had the use of both hands and one leg? Like she just hit him in the leg with a wooden branch and not even that hard. The director is Diego Cohen and he's only got a couple of films under his belt, but I guess this is his most known entry or most maligned one, since it's at a mere 2.3 on IMDb, a ranking that is equal to that of Slaughtered Vomit Dolls, which is going to be my unit of measurement from here on in. But on Letterboxd, this only ranks a 1.3 for a double score of 2.6, and a combined 4.9, our first film here to go under the five star mark. And honestly, I have no clue why this one is so far up here. Yes, it's bad, it's, it's pretty damn bad. But its biggest crime is that it's just incredibly dull. It, it's not hard to watch or anything, considering that so little happens that you can sort of, you know, do some other stuff while you watch and not miss anything, which, you know, makes the time go by faster. And it's only an hour and 10 minutes long, so it's not like you'll be screaming and wailing for it to be over. It's just amateurish and slow, poorly edited, but I would watch it over a large number of other things if I had to. Like, I would watch this again before watching any single one of the Transformers movies, particularly since it'd be over in a third of the time. <laughs> Number two. Oh, getting so close, so close to getting through this, and our next film was offered up by No Bill, and it's from 2005, and it's Zombies with a Z on the end. The opening text gives us the scientific aspect of zombies as someone controlled with specific drugs. It then has this guy being chased by two people with weapons and they catch him and eat him because I suppose they're zombies. Um, and then there's, there's Josephine here and she's working and her boss is a dick. And then she sees one of the zombies. I, I guess I'm gonna call them zombies, but they, they look just like regular people. There seems to be a very minimal amount of makeup on them, if any at all. But they run and carry weapons, but the police won't believe her. But then things take a turn when a couple of them arrive at her front door and kidnap both her and her husband and more just running around. There's an awful lot of shots of Josephine just sort of running from here to there. And occasionally there's dictionary entries for various words that vaguely have to do with what's going on on screen. And of course, M more running. Uh, by this point, we're about a half hour into the movie and there really hasn't been much plot. It's just been Josephine in encounter to encounter with not much plot in between. But, but you can't say it's boring, I suppose. And this is another one that's seemingly made for whatever pocket change was found in the couch. And the director is Zachary Snig, who often goes by the name John Backus, and also ZWS, and also Z Winston Brown, and also the Snig Brothers. He's made a series of low-budget, urban-oriented horror films, including the surprisingly enjoyable Bloods vs. Wolves, a sort of black underworld, but I guess also has done some softcore flicks like Kinky Kong, and also the kinda hilarious and trash-tastic Beaster Day about the giant killer rabbit. And, and, and this score is ridiculously low. IMDb has this one at a mere 1.5. A 1.5! The only other movie I've covered here that got a score in the ones on IMDb is Cocaine Shark, and that was just barely at a 1.9. This is a 1.5 out of 10. Letterboxd only has this at a 1.2, which is again, the lowest score that we've seen so far on this list. Double that for the 2.4 out of 10, and we only have a total of 3.9, one full point lower than Romina. And honestly, you guys, I, I don't get it. For a movie to be ranked this low, I was really braced. I was set up for something unbearably bad. But this is whatever. It, it's cheap and amateurish and sure is silly that the zombies are just people. And, and there's no real plot. It's just Josephine running from situation to situation. But I, I, I couldn't get mad at it. I mean, the acting was basic bad and some of the actors were decent even. And it felt like they were like shooting for some sort of almost real time action tale. But I've seen way worse than this, way, way worse. So for this to be the second worst ranked film on this list and one of the worst totals I've seen out of all the films I've covered for this concept overall, I expected way more pain. Number one. All right, more pain. 
Here's the bottom of this particular barrel, and it was given to me by Cabbage Head, and it's 2007's Curse of the Zodiac. The opening text reminds us who the real-life Zodiac killer was and what he did, and in that case, was unsolved and unclosed. We're then in San Francisco, and a voiceover is the Zodiac, giving a warning to a police officer saying that he's going to kill someone in a bar. And then there's just a bunch of random footage of people in bars with a number of filters placed over top of them. And his voice talking and some people <laughs> arguing. These nuts! You're at 10 o'clock, I'm at 2 a.m., baby! I am four hours beyond your ass! And then this stripper is killed and thi thi this is how it's edited. So I suppose if you're sensitive to flashing lights, this might qualify. I, I think this is supposed to be set in the 70s and there's also a psychic girl who is having visions of the killings, but I guess he's also aware of her. And it is really, really hard to figure out what is even happening with the way that this is shot and edited. And this is more like it. This is next level bad. This shows so little understanding of any sort of filmmaking technique, and it's very hard to tell if this is some sort of experimental filmmaking, or if this is someone who just shot a bunch of random footage and had no idea how to put it all together, so they just did all this instead. And it's not like this is some rank amateur either, since this is both written and directed by Uli Lommel. And this isn't even his first appearance on one of my worst ever lists. I had previously covered his film Zombie Nation. And I have to say, c compared to this one, that film was downright polished. Plus, Uli's been in the industry since the 70s and has given us some good stuff. He made the original Boogeyman film and the Devonsville Terror. So it's not like he has no clue how to make a movie. But somewhere along the way, he sort of embraced this super low budget, sort of thrown together style of filmmaking. And for a while, he seemed to be really into making films about real life serial killers. He did a movie about BTK, one called Green River Killer, one called Black Dahlia, Son of Sam, and then this one. And here's the thing, this is, I guess, a sequel. He made a film in 2005 called Uli Lamo's Zodiac Killer, but that was about a modern day copycat killer. So this is, I guess, a prequel featuring the actual killer back in the 70s. And whereas that was also low rated, it's nothing compared to this movie. A whole lot of this is just a psychic girl trying to convince her boyfriend that she's seeing real things, and it's mostly improvised dialogue, I'm guessing, and it goes on forever. And, and this is just really hard to get through. Really hard to get through. This might be as much of an endurance test as slaughtered vomit dolls, but just in a very, very different way. And oddly enough, they share an aesthetic in that they're both improvised dialogue, just sort of layered on top of itself with filters draped on top until any sort of coherence is unrecognizable. And this has a 1.3 on IMDb, the lowest ranking that we have here, with a letterbox score of just 1.1. That doubled is only a 2.2, so it has a total of a measly 3.5 out of 20. Our lowest score here, and finally, one that I totally agree with. Honestly, I'd still rather watch this than Slaughtered Vomit, but I'll also say that even without the whole gross out aspect of that one, I'd, I'd still rather watch this. So there you have it, 10 movies that were recommended by you guys, and I have to say, eh, Eh, not that tough. Um, seven out of ten of these were actually fairly easy to watch. Slaughter Vomit Dolls was absolutely one of the hardest things to get through because not only was it just gross, not only did you just have the whole ick factor of it all, it was just bad filmmaking. Um, and yeah, several of the other ones in there just not good, but uh, for the most part, quite a few of these were pretty tolerable. Let me know down below in the comments which of these you've seen. Let me know which one of these you would uh, really attempt to see. And if you think you can 
find one that's worse. If you think you can find one that has a lower ranking on both IMDb and Letterboxd, find it for me. Tell me down below in the comments and maybe we'll do it on a future video. Um, if you liked this video, hit that like button. If you like what you see on this channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell so you get notified when new videos arrive. And if you think about it, go to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash movie timelines. You can help support this channel. I'd appreciate that. And otherwise, I'll see you right around here for another great video very, very soon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.